from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning. I want to thank each of you for taking the time to come to the most beautiful building in Washington, D.C., but most especially uh, to the Coolidge Auditorium uh, to be a part of uh, our Veterans Day programming. As direct, I'm Karen Lloyd, and I'm the director of the Veterans History Project. And as a retired Army aviator, I'm also the widow, sibling, and child of veterans. And I'm so pleased to welcome you, especially the veterans, to the Library of Congress. The library makes a special effort this week in particular to honor and recognize veterans and their families and to explore the ways military men and women have connected to home and family during and after their service from World War I through the current conflicts. We are proud to collaborate with our colleagues from across the library to offer a series of events titled Coming Home, Veterans Day at the Library of Congress. In the back you will find this handy card with all of today's programmings, many of which align to our exhibit, Echoes of the Great War. This e e exhibit examines the upheaval of the World War as Americans confronted it, both at home and abroad. It's located up here in the Jefferson Building, and it's compellingly rendered, offers glimpses of the human condition, transcendent of time and place, in part through over 30 collections from the Veterans History Project. I hope you'll find time to see it. I'd also ask that you consider taking a copy of not just this library magazine, but also the other one that we have um, in the back um, as you depart. It focuses in part on the Veterans History Project and our collections. Now a little bit about the Veterans History Project. It provides inspiration and instruction to foster a nationwide volunteer effort for individuals to reach out to the veterans in their lives and listen, really listen, and send and donate those collections to the library so that we have those oral histories and first-person narratives from World War I through the current conflict. Veterans like Mr. Greenwald, whose family graciously donated his interview to the Veterans History Project and whose words come alive both through the exhibit and through this morning's portrayal by Douglas Terrell. After the performance, both Douglas and our senior reference specialist, Megan Harris, will answer your questions. So again, thank you for joining us today. And a special shout out to the Greenwald family who made a special effort to come today. And we're so appreciative of that. So thank you. $650. That's what I made with my shop, me and Leah. We had a nice shop on 22nd East 70th Street. We sold candles, high-grade candles, candy, dentist, barber supplies, tobacco, good tobacco. On April 2nd, 1917, our president, Woodrow Wilson, stood before a quiet joint session of Congress. And he asked that the United States of America declare war against the German Empire. It is a fearful thing to lead this great, peaceful people into war. America must abandon the peace which she has treasured. She can do no other. So off I was into the United States Army. 
I was drafted in December of 1917. My name, Private First Class Irving Greenwald, E Company of the 308. We were part of the 77th Division. I was drafted with four million other young, brave boys. Our war was called the war to end all wars. Now just imagine that, a war to end all war. It was called the Great War. My camp, Camp Upton in Yapang, Long Island. My day started waking up at 5.30 a.m. for Reveille, drilling with the bayonet and, and how to put on and take off a gas mask. Lectures on how not to engage in any tomfoolery, strenuous exercises, and supper. Supper was usually uh, frankfurters, uh, sauerkraut, bread, potatoes, and coffee. Lots and lots of coffee. Not too bad. Not too good either, but not too bad. After supper, I'd head to the YMCA to buy some uh, tobacco or have some ice cream, or to telephone Leah if, if I could get in line after supper. I'd head to, back to my bunk to do some reading or some writing, usually a letter to Leah or Mama. And I'd always kiss Leah's pictures before I went to bed. Not before saying my prayers, of course. Can I be honest? I lie awake many nights thinking how unfair and unkind the Army was to send so many of us boys away from home. It's not really fair when you were to think about it. My favorite days at camp were always when the passes to go home for the weekend were posted up on the wall. Oh, I'd be so happy that I'd, I'd run and, and I'd telephone Leah and she'd be so delighted that she would just, she would just cry. <laughs> My Leah. She had an angel's face. She was graceful and strong. She was everything. She was everything to me. My entire goal at camp was always to come home and to be with her as much as I could. When we go home for the weekends, I take her to the theater. The theater would be full of men in uniform. We'd always go see Jack O'Lantern with Fred Stone. He was without a doubt my favorite comedian. I'd always kiss her outside the, the theater. You see, it's not very polite to kiss outside in public. <laughs> I'd hold her in my arms and I'd whisper to God that he'd keep me home, grant me a year of peace, happiness, and a healthy baby. You see, we were gonna have a child. We were gonna be a family. I prayed to God that he'd grant me this one wish, this one wish that I could hold my child before I am shipped off. But I wasn't. I was shipped off before I ever saw my beautiful baby Cecily born. I'd, uh, I'd write in my journal to keep my mind from picturing the horrors of my prospective journey. When that dreaded day came and I had to tell Leah that I was, that I was shipping off, she was broken hearted. We both were. We both realized that this might be the last time we would hear each other's voices. I prayed that I would come back to her, but I, I fear that I may never see her again. So, we were given three sandwiches, a cup of coffee, a hundred rounds of ammunition, <laughs> and off to France we go. Uh, we were we were packed like sardines on these transport ships. I mean, these were the most comfortable voyages whatsoever. No arrangements for bathing was, was made, and, mm, uh, and the toilets, the toilets would be overflowing with human waste. I mean, they'd be so filthy that you would deny yourself from ever using them. I mean, it's a lot of boys on these ships, so you get the idea, it's pretty nasty stuff. 
I mean, we don't catch, uh, uh, mm, mm, we don't catch dysentery from the filth and disease in the food. Mm, the food wasn't much better either. For breakfast, we get a piece of unappetizing fish, and for dinner, a piece of meat that was tough as leather. It would all be rejected by everyone. I mean, the only edible thing would be the pudding, if you could keep it down. I mean, with the foul stench down below and the tossing the ship above, it was tough to keep anything down. I'd eat a few biscuits, but they'd all always come back up. Ugh. I'd walk to my bucket like it was a natural thing. It's hard to believe, but I, I find myself missing the food from Camp Upton. Up until now, I have not realized the truth of the geography of the world. It is two-thirds water. It is water, water, and water. I, I'd come to the rails and I'd always dream of home and mama and Mia and my soon-to-be baby. Dolphins. Dolphins would follow our ships for miles. They'd always jump and play in the waves. It all attract many of us boys to the rails. <laughs> We'd all talk and, and think about the death that lay ahead for us. Interesting days. Days full of spirit, full of adventure. This was our great adventure. On land, we travel in third class railway cars. We go from England and all the way to France. And on the way, we see uh, children and, and women. Oh, the women, the English women. They had these red cheeks and red noses. Oh, the boys would just go wild when they would see them. They'd all wave from their backyards as we rode past on the trains. And the food, the food wasn't so bad. In France, we get, for breakfast, we get canned sausage, bread, butter, jam, and coffee. Lots and lots of coffee. <laughs> you see, a soldier cannot fight without coffee. Once we got to France, Things changed for us. The first village we came to was blown to bits, and then the next, and the next. Death and destruction greeted your eyes. You could hear and feel the roar from the battle. Trees which usually lined ponds and streams were shattered and splintered. The earth, the earth was filled with holes 15 feet deep, 25 feet wide, monster pits made by monster guns. Such a beautiful country wrapped with so much death and destruction. As you got closer to the lines, you could feel the earth shiver beneath your feet. Flashes in the sky from the guns and slow rising artillery signals and flares. It all looked like a like a 4th of July fireworks celebration from back home. There's an example of greatness in man. But it's all being degraded by the use to which these machines are being put to. Big guns pounded away at the French towns, turning them into piles of rubble. You had to respect the French people, I did especially the woman. They had so much courage. They withstood a tremendous amount of shelling. 
I remember one French madam, a, a small woman. She was walking in her bare feet with tears in her eyes. She had her hands up and she was saying, Je peux. Je peux. Aide moi. Je peux. I'm scared. I'm scared. Please help. In my opinion, the use of shell in war is a cowardly thing to do. I mean, you cannot combat it. It comes at you so fast that all you can do is wait for death. I'd be glad to fight face to face. We were part of a huge offensive. It was called the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Our goal was to drive up between the Argonne Forest and the Meuse River. You see, General Pershing's idea was to cut the German supply lines and drive the Germans out of France. But the problem with the Argonne Forest was that it was so thick with trees, you couldn't see more than 10 feet in front of you. And it was filled with thorny bushes that would slice right through you when you fell on them. Up until that offensive, no one knew if, if the Americans could fight. But after that offensive, the world learned how tough the doughboys were. <laughs> right before our big push, our brigadier general, a major, they gathers around a French square. Our general looks intently into each man's eye. Boys, I know you're dreadfully keen to get in the game and that you're all going to punch it. And you'll make America proud. So there you have it. The fate of England and France in our hands. I became scared for the first time since arriving in France. What scared me the most was the probability that I would have to die in a trench on my, on my wedding day. I was content that I would have to die in this war, but I didn't want to die in a trench on my wedding anniversary. I prayed to God that he would, that he would grant me this wish. I wrote Mama to buy a, a bouquet of chrysanthemums for Leah. I may not be alive on that day, but I wanted her to know that I thought of her on our wedding anniversary. Over the days, I became really good at writing really small and writing letters to Leah and Mama. I was really good at utilizing every inch of blank space in the letter. It's a small item to crow about, but paper. Paper has a high value in war. And if you can utilize it to the fullest, you feel like you've done something to be proud of. War has a way of teaching man how to be proud of the smallest victories. Over the next several months, our nights became cold. They became the filthiest, most rat infested places you could ever imagine. 
We, uh, we lived and fought in the mud. I hated the mud. A lot of men died in the mud. We called our homes hell on earth. Rats. Rats would crawl right over your face when you were trying to sleep. And millions of flies would feast over the dead men in the open graves and the cooties. The cooties were the greatest little devils. I mean, everyone had them of all sizes and breeds, big, plump, white ones. I mean, they'd all, always find a warm spot. As soon as you put your head down, they'd crawl down and up and around your neck and into your trousers. I mean, to refrain from scratching them would require all the willpower you could muster. Over time, I, I became shaky from the continual thunder of the guns. It, if, it affected your nerves. It, uh, it affected a lot of the men. When a shell would, would break, I would hug the ground, listening for the fragments of hot, scalding bits of metal to strike upon the earth. I, I was right next to Carney, whose life was saved when a piece of shrapnel came flying in. If it wasn't for him having his hand to his face and eating a piece of bread, his head would have been blown completely off. Luck. Luck had a lot to do whether you lived or died in war. It's what scared you the most. The luck part, it, it scared me. The action started that day when Lieutenant picked me as a runner. I, my job was to carry messages to and from commanders. You see, they would send six men out hoping that one would get through. It is the most deathly, suicidal job you can have. To run between enemy lines, dodging machine gun fire, shrapnel, hoping you won't running past a German sniper, waiting to pick you off. A lot of brave men died as runners. Brave, tired men dying as Aaron boys. But you know what? I was glad. I was glad because I never wanted to kill a man with a bayonet. The English, they loved the bayonet. They, they talked to me with such charm and, and animation. You must love the bayonet. I resented that such a killing instrument could ever be used in war. As a runner, you zigzag through the forest. You don't just run from point A to point B. You hide behind a tree. You fall to the ground. You use your senses. You run to another tree. You look for landmarks. You wait for a shell to explode. You run. You fall to the ground. You run. You fall to the ground. You run, you hide behind a bush, behind a dead horse, behind a dead soldier. You see, in war, you use anything and everything if it means your survival. The smell, the smell of death is all around you. Dead men, black with decay, improperly, hastily buried with body parts sticking up out of the ground. It is, it is the most fearful thing in the dark. I, I hated to leave a man like that, but you have to. You have to go on. You find the courage to go on. As I run up the hill, I am at the mercy of the snipers and the shells. Vivid flashes of fire. My ears ring. My, my heart stops beating. As I, as I run up the hill, I, I think of home, 
Mama, Leah, baby Cecily. I say a prayer for the Lord to get me through this safely. Then suddenly another shell explodes and I, oh! Oh! I hug the earth. I lie flat. I want to go on. It is worse to wait for death than, than to face it. I curse the shell. Surprise that I'm that I'm still alive. I I get up. I run. I run like that. Not a soul to be seen. Every house torn down, piled up in the middle of the streets. I climb over wreckage. More men rotting, and I see one man stretched out in front of a ruined church. And I am. I am glad that he's not rotting away in some trench or in, or in the woods. Luck. Not to the cellar of a farmhouse. I see Lieutenant McDougal. I deliver my messages in my important papers. And he scolds me and questions me for have taken so long. And he orders me to immediately return back to the trenches. Numb and, and dejected, I... Yes, sir. I... I must run through the death and destruction. Again, I must run past the dead men. I... I see... Uh, two more dead men. It's a woeful sight. Face black, eyes gone. I see another one hunched over position by his gun. Face is, is indistinguishable. It, it, it sickens me to run past the dead men. Frightened, I, I run. I run till my heart almost burst. I cannot breathe, I run down the hill, out of the woods and back to our, our trenches. It no longer occurs to me to liken battle to some distant Fourth of July celebration. I am incensed that so many of our dead men lie in the streets and the villages near us unburied. I want all of us to go down and have the bodies all completely buried. But No volunteers from any of the dugouts. I do not fancy the job any more than the other boys do, but I feel out of decency the men, the men must be given a human burial. Me, Thurn, and Summers, we choose to go. We want to feel human again. We see one lad with a big gaping hole in his chest, six inches wide. It must have killed him instantly. I, I see another one. He is much more of a pitiful sight. He is burnt to a cinder. It, uh, it hurts to look upon the, the dead men, but I, I steal myself and I perform what I consider a human duty. As we put the men in the graves, it almost feels as if it is a reward for them. Mentally, I feel, I feel sick. 
I am reminded to write a letter to, to Leah for the simple satisfaction that I could do it. I write and I tell her how much I love her and I pray that her and baby Cecily are well. All night long, I, I see the dead men. Especially the man who was burnt. I ponder the mystery of life and death. I have just witnessed the wonder of life and the helplessness of death. Why do men do it? Why do they kill? Why do they destroy? The cost of it, the futility of it, why not end this war and spare all the men and women? I mean, this war will never be won on the battlefield. I have no courage to live, no will to, to fight, to go on. I hold on by thinking of Leah, baby Cecily. My eyes are bad from all the tear gas. My throat is sore, my lungs are congested. As I look around, I see a more pitiful sight. I see some of our boys and French soldiers who have been tear gassed. They are in great pain. Their eyes are red and swollen. They are coughing and vomiting and they are heavily burnt around the arms and the leg. You see, you cannot smell mustard gas. Your nose becomes accustomed to it from smelling it so much. It almost has a, a sweet aroma to it, like onions or, or garlic. Once you're exposed, red spots begin to show up on your skin. And they quickly turn into painful, big red blisters. And eventually you feel the pain and, and, and the swelling in your nose and in your lungs. And you die. No. No, you, you drown. You drown from all the mucus in your lungs. It is a brutal weapon. If Leah only knew how foolishly I risked my life today, she would most definitely cry. I think how unfair this business of war is especially to all the mothers and wives back home. After dinner, our captain tells us that a barrage will be sent over into the German lines and that we will go over the top to mop up afterwards into no man's land. We will wait for his whistle, climb out of these trenches, tumble out, charge 30 yards through the barbed wire entanglement and zigzag towards our enemy, hoping to escape death. I grow angry at this war and the men who prolong it at the sight of so much destruction. I wonder if I will ever be given the chance to, to see home. We are given orders to wait, which gives us time to wonder and shudder at what the night has in store for us. In the dark, I, I use my pack for a, 
for a pillow. I sit, I wait, I pray, and I think. Are we fit to fight? No. At 9 p.m., the door to hell is open. I mean, every gun fires for all it's worth. It is the most wicked snap and crack to them, all of it which makes it necessary to shout when talking. The sky is lit up with red, white, green flares over the entire German lines. It is shrapnel which bursts continually into an instant flash. A million twinkling stars that show up for one second and appear in others, but a second later, they are they're like beautiful dancing lights. Lieutenant, he comes tearing down the trench, stepping over men indiscriminately, pitilessly hurting heads and ankles, and then he shouts, I need six more runners, one from each company, now! No volunteers from any of the dugouts. I, I hide my face, and then I hear, Greedy! He picks me again. He picks his victims. I, God, I will, I will never make it home. He also picks Riley, Solomon, and Al Thompson. A small man, a good man, who was so scared in the account of all the shelling. That night, we were all scared. The tenant tells us that it is our mission to find 1st Battalion, and that it's imperative that we establish a communication line. We will wait for his whistle. And then we tumble out and we go over the top into the dark, thorny bush into no man's land. And it's thick and, and dark and we're immediately lost. I, 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 Riley and I shout and suddenly out of nowhere a machine gun nest opens up. And, and Al Thompson, he is shot in the head by a machine gun. Good old Al Thompson. I was, this morning I was joking with him and now he is no more. A good man, a, a father or two and a man who should have never been in the army. I, I mourn his loss. Lieutenant turns and scolds at us for not keeping up. I believe I can keep up with him better than Riley. So I, I, I work my way forward, stumbling ahead, almost slicing my arms off against the bob wire hitting in the brush stabbing my hands and my face. We are, to the best of my knowledge, deep into no man's land, a plain sight for Kaiser snipers. The pace is it's fast, and I am panting, and Lieutenant, in dismay, and questioningly, he, he stops again and yells at us, catch up! Aimlessly, we race on, leaping trenches, narrow and wide, crashing into a brush. Thirsty, but we cannot rest, with all the machine gun nests all around us. Breathless. Senseless with fear. Uh, Lieutenant, he draws out his revolver with a pale face, and he is a sight for an artist. We must hurry to the other side of the hill before we are cut down by machine gun fire. The guns are thunder, the flares are lightning, and the rain is shrapnel. And then suddenly, right in front of Lieutenant and Riley, a shell explodes, and I literally watch him. disappear. Mrs. Leah Greenwald, deeply regret to inform you that it is officially reported that Private Irving W. Greenwald Infantry was wounded in action. October 8th, degree undetermined. Further information when received.
It is October 22nd. I've been in the hospital for about two weeks. Food hasn't been so bad, not so good, but not so bad. For breakfast, I get a bowl of rice, applesauce, bread, and coffee. Lots and lots of coffee. I can't get enough of the coffee. Every few days, I get cornmeal mush with plenty of sugar and what seems to be real milk. Some of the best milk I've had in a long, long time. As I clear the window panes to look out, what strikes me is the change in color in nature. Where it used to be green, it is now red, yellow, and gold. What I notice the most is I don't, I don't hear the continual thunder from the shells anymore. It is quiet. The sun streams upon my back and I can hear a trolley bear bell. ringing outside. Every morning I listen to it. It's such a, such a pleasant reminder of home. Miss Johnson, my nurse, she comes to clean my wound. <laughs> she is a, uh, a kind, plump, red-faced girl from Des Moines, Iowa. As she removes my dressings, a stream of pus flows from my wound. I was struck by a piece of shrapnel from the shell that killed Lieutenant and Riley. The doctor, a uh, first lieutenant, a young man, he's of the opinion that there is a uh, piece of shrapnel still lodged in my wound, that it must be fished out. He says, son, I need to do a little fishing. So he turns me over my side and he says, this is gonna hurt. For 10 minutes, with his fingers, he probes mm, into the back of my leg. Mm. Mm. Miss Johnson, she holds down my leg, but mm, mm, I can't keep very still because every time he digs into the back of my leg, he touches a nerve. Mm, mm, this. I, I, I clench my fist, I grit my teeth, I breathe heavily. Anything to help me withstand it without screaming. This fishing and poking goes on every day I was in the hospital just about until finally I say, no! That is enough of your fishing and poking. The doctor, he gives me a dirty look. But satisfied with my resolve, he orders Miss Johnson to bandage my leg and that is the end of that. As I look around, instead of strong, straight men, I see cripples in every direction. They are all beyond cure. I notice a boy coming out of the operation room with one leg. He, is, he has tears in his face and he is crying in incredible pain. Seems another doctor performed one of his delicate operations. 
I noticed a girl-faced boy of 17, who later I found out enlisted when he was 15. He continually, he continually cries for his mama. He's having a piece of shrapnel removed from his spine. Ten inches of his spine show from his skull downwards. I see men with great burns, faces distorted. All of them with big, graping wounds in them. I am, I am deeply affected and saddened by all the mothers and wives who who gave up so many brave boys for this cause. And all the mothers, I heard so many boys cry out to dying in the trenches and in no man's land. There's a deep feeling of lonesomeness in me, a longing for a letter from Leah or Mama that I cannot suppress. I dream of home and of, oh, of Leah coming to visit me with my baby. They are delicious dreams. I have faith that in a few days I will be home and I will be able to give Leah and baby Cecily a virgin kiss. On October 31st, the war started to end. Turkey capitulates and agrees to lay down all her arms. In Austria, she throws up her hands. And on November 4th, a soldier comes running in with a newspaper and he shouts for our silence. He has our attention. There's an a an expected law. And then he calls it, Boys, Germany has agreed to sign the armistice with the Allies! Oh, three cheers and a yell can be heard all the way back to Paris. <laughs> Cripples are no longer, church bells rings, and the French are overjoyed with, with the news. Shorty, <laughs> Shorty gets on the piano and starts swinging from the rafters, leading the cheering. I cheer standing up in bed, and Walter, Walter plays the Star Spangled Banner. All the boys, they gather around the piano and they're singing and shouting and dancing and drinking. Plenty of drinking. I wasn't a drinking man, but that day I had a few drinks. And as I look out the window, I, I remember thinking, how glad that I was alive and this war, this war is finally over. A week later, Monday, November 11th, 1918, the armistice with Germany is signed. All terms are agreed upon and all firing ceases at 11 o'clock. And my first thought are for the lads, no doubt many, who gave up their lives right before 11 o'clock. It is a pity. On our transport ships, we, uh, we steam into the harbor of Newport News Land lights twinkle like, like mirror to stars. And, oh, and I can see the flashes from the trolley wires. All evidence that we are in good old America. I don't think of America as much as I think of Leah and baby Cecily. On our ships, 
I get my things. I make my bed. I tidy my bunk. I dress. I shine my shoes. I, I shave with, <laughs> with infinite care. At 9.30, I'm given my pass. I am, I am ready to go in a jiffy. I, I walk on air. The doctor, he comes on board and he, he, he checks my wound. No pus, no pain. I make it down to the docks without assistance and I see the ever-present Red Cross ladies with chocolate and, 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 and cigarettes. I will never forget the bravery and kindness of the women of the Red Cross. I see advertising signs and, and wooden houses and, and civilians, all of it which are sights that are so familiar to me and gladdens my heart. I sing and I whistle all the way home. When we get to Camp Stewart, I am reminded of what I said when I first left Camp Upton, that I hope I never see the barracks again. But how glad I am to see them now. I am home. I know it, I can feel it in every thought, in every bone in my body. I cannot believe my good fortune. I'm finally going home. everyone. My name is Megan Harris. I'm the reference specialist for the Veterans History Project, and I wanted to say thank you for coming to this wonderful performance. I hope that it resonated with you. Uh, in the audience, we actually have members of Irving Greenwald's family, his daughter, and grandchildren. And I wanted to say thank you to them uh, for donating this wonderful diary, Irving Greenwald's original diary on which this performance was based. Um, so that it could be shared and interpreted in this performance. So we have a few minutes. Um, I'd love to answer questions. I know Mr. Terrell would like to answer questions from you as well. Um, and I'd also like to encourage you to go up to the World War I exhibit uh, to see Irving Greenwald's original diary on which the performance was based. So if, um, I know that Mr. Terrell has another performance at 2 p.m., uh, actually a different production, and he said that he would be able to spend just a few minutes with us answering questions about the performance and his process. If anyone has any questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so I, my two o'clock performance is called The American Soldier, and it's based on different letters from different veterans from all the wars. Um, so the Library of Congress contacted me, and they offered me six diaries to kind of look through, and they asked me if I would be interested in 
in uh, creating a project to honor, to celebrate the centennial of the First World War. And the first, I was very, as I, I've said in many times in a couple of interviews, the work that Selma did is so valuable because a lot of the diary, all the other diaries, they weren't transcribed. So they were written. So she, by her typewriting it and then it being digitized, it allowed me to basically treat it as text and I could basically read it and take notes from it. And so from that process, I just basically curated to stuff that I really liked and try to create a beginning, middle, and end with my director. Um, Patrick Willis, so he should be in here somewhere. Um, there he is. And so that's how, that's how we you know, kind of we came to it. Um, but I mean, it was a, it was a very tedious, long process still, but I mean, it took me six months. Um, the goal was always to, um, the, the, do I need it now? <laughs> I didn't need it then, did I? <laughs> um, I hate mics. Um, um, so yeah, so it basically what I would do is I would highlight stuff that I like and I would put them into a document and then I would read through that and, and I read the diary from beginning to end. So, um, and then eventually I would go from 30,000 words, 15,000 words, 10,000 words, and I finally had needed to get it to 7,000 words and then I started crafting it into what it is today. But the diary is so powerful and he was such an eloquent writing, a writer that, I mean, you can make four plays out of his diary. So it was really tough because and if anybody knows anything about editing or writing, deletion is always the toughest thing to do uh, because, you know, you, I mean, I did his, his passage on the ship was about as gruesome as time on the trenches. Um, and he really talks about it really elaborately, but, you know, in, in fairness to, to theatrical production, you know, we had to move past that, so. Yeah. What do you regret most leaving out? Or what if, that's if a good you had question. another 30 minutes, what would you have put in? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, the, the very beginning, because there's a couple of two moments that I really couldn't find a way, because I was, I was also constrained by time. You know, she said, you know, you have about 45, 50 minutes only. So that was a big parameter for what I had to do. But there's a moment in the diary in the beginning where he really doesn't want to go off the war. And he actually gets on a train and he's going to go AWOL. Um, and he was a man, apparently, and I'm sure they, what, what I've deduced, his name was everything to him. And so he was terrified that Leah, he loved his wife so much, that Leah would be stained with having a name of a husband who had gone AWOL. So he literally gets on the train, and he jumps off last minute. And he, he, and he talks about it and how the, he, he's about the steam and the engines, and it's something like right out of Harry Potter, the way he describes it. And it's beautiful. And I had it in there, and I, it just it, it didn't fit with the arc of what I was trying to do, uh, what we were trying to do. And so, and then, and then the other point, when he's in the trenches, he's actually told he can go home, and he's ecstatic. And then they come up to him and say, well, "I'm sorry, we made a mistake. It's not you. It's someone else." And so he's just like, "That's where that line comes. I have no will to live. I have no courage to fight anymore." So I took that line and I put it there because he's really devastated from that. And that's where he says, I think I'll never make it home now. And he was part of the, the Lost Battalion. If anybody knows anything about the Lost Battalion is, you know, they, they, they suffered tremendous casualties. And from what I get from um, Greeny, so what I call him, because that's what the boys called him. They called him Greeny. Um, he was a fairly successful man. And he had a good shop, you know, and he had a wife who had a baby. He had a good life. Uh, it was very, sounded like he was very educated. Um, he would have to be to write like this. And so to see him part of the trenches, living with rats, and, and there, was part, there was parts where they were starving to death, they had no water, they had a choice of drinking chlorinated water or no water. Um, to see him go from that extreme to that extreme, and then, and the whole time, all he does is talk about Leah and, and baby Cecily. So he must have been madly, in, mad, were they madly in love? I have to ask because because it feels like I mean he almost every paragraph he mentions her name um, so those are the two big spots that I wish I could have somehow crafted you know it seems like he wants to go home so bad that he even gets on a train he's willing to go AWOL but he gets scared because he's afraid of what that will do to his name 
and he jumps the train. So, yeah. Ask Let her. Son, ask a question here. Who were the other five people of the di other five diaries? Those were his, that's my son. <laughs> <laughs> of course, my son's going to ask a question. <laughs> Those were his buddies. He, they fought with a lot, a lot of buddies, son. You can see some of them in the exhibition if you go upstairs. Joel T. Boone was one example. Uh, you have a question? Uh, your performance is so rich. I hope it is being, and, and the editorial job, I didn't realize you had also created the text from the diary. It just, it's a splendid thing. Uh, I hope this is going to be recorded and you're recording it somewhere so it can be they broadcast are. They are. larger. I don't, broadcast, I don't know, but they're definitely recording it. Yes. Okay, and the other question I have, uh, I understand he had a son who died in World War II. Yeah. Can we hear something about his life? I don't know much about it. I just found that out through Naomi. Um, you had a brother that died in the Second World War, correct? Yeah. I mean, the, the performance is really about the diary, and it, it's the story of the diary. Um, so, you know, any. We generally, with Veterans Project, History Project submissions, we let the material speak for itself. And that's uh, essentially what this archives is designed to do, is to make it uh, accessible for researchers, for performers, um, for the general public to um, read into it and read into it what they will. So we don't do a lot of research into the backstory of materials um, simply because that's the job for researchers and for other folks who are going to use the materials. I think there's one last question over here. Hey. Um, just um, the journal, did it end when he got back or did he continue to write and was there more beyond and how uh, his it, life developed after that? It pretty much ends, it pretty much ends the way I um, ended it in the play. Uh, it's actually so well written. I mean, when you're reading it, you know, the problem with also, even with Greeny's diary, and my second show, I dealt with that a lot. You know, soldiers, from, for the most time, they, they write in fragments, a lot of them, because they just, they're just trying to get through the day. And Greeny did the same thing. He wrote, a, there's huge chunks where it's just tedious, boring stuff and fragments, fragments, and then he would just poof, explode into this amazing, eloquent prose. Um, but when you're reading his diary, I mean, it ends like, uh, it goes into two sections as you're reading it. He's literally, and we're running through the trenches, and then Riley dies, and then this dies, and an explosion, 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 and then literally it says, end of entry. Like, what? What do you mean, end of entry? What? What? what, what? And you're flicking through it. Well, it's got to be more, no entry. And the next entry starts off with, it's October 22nd, I've been in the hospital for two weeks. So that he was injured on September 28th, so, you, so he's probably injured fairly bad, and he probably was unconscious, is what I imagine. And so then it, then it goes into the hospital. The hospital goes on for a long time, because they actually move him to hospitals. Um, but then he comes home, and that's, and, um, that's basically how it, it ends. He, it a actually ends with him making a phone call in the snow, calling Leah. Says, today I'm gonna go make a phone call. It's pretty cold out there, but I'm gonna go ahead and brave it. I wanna hear her voice, and that's the end of the diary. So it's very cinematic. Chris. Oh, I think we have time for one quick question. Were there any stories that really surprised you that you didn't expect when you were initially going into it? Yeah, no and yes. I mean, I've talked, to this, I've talked about this with my director, but it really is, and I've become a student of war because of my, my next show, my, my, the other show that I've written, so I've been studying all the battles a lot. And all these brave men and women have, their commitment and sacrifice is something that we can never really measure. Um, but when you study the First World War, what I, it really is like a horror show. I mean, because it's, yeah, what, what you have to remember, it's the beginning of the industrial age and it's the beginning of the machinery. It was the first time that we were using machines to fight in war. And so society and, and human beings really had not I mean, there was actually moments in the First World War where the French were still trying to fight on cavalry, and they kept getting gunned down by machine guns, and they couldn't understand why their tactics weren't being working. And this went on on both sides. So they, I mean, they lost, comparatively what Americans lost to what the French and English lost is a drop in the bucket. I mean, they lost something like 17 million men. I mean, 
it's an, on, if today anybody did that, I mean, it would be a revolt. So I think what surprised me is just the pure carnage of, of what the war is and the way Greeny describes it. I mean, he describes it like dead men, black and decay, faces. I mean, so when you're reading, you're just like, it's hard to believe. So I'll just leave it at that, not to go too deep into it, the gory stuff, but just how, how, um, how violent that war was. Again, thank you so much for coming, and we encourage you again to go up to the exhibit and <clears throat> perhaps to come back at 2 p.m. 2 p.m. for a different performance, but equally moving, I'm sure. So thank you to Mr. Thank Trout. you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Good afternoon, and welcome to the most beautiful building in Washington, D.C., and to the Coolidge Auditorium. I'm Karen Lloyd, and as director of the Veterans History Project, and as a retired Army aviator, I'm also the widow, sibling, and child of veterans. I am so pleased to welcome you, especially the veterans, to the Library of Congress. The library makes a special effort this week, in particular, to honor and recognize veterans and their families, and to explore the ways that military men and women have connected to home and family during and after their service, from World War I through the current conflicts. We are proud to collaborate with our colleagues from across the library to offer a series of events titled Coming Home, Veterans Day at the Library of Congress. In the back, you will find this handy card with all of today's programs, many of which align with our exhibit, Echoes of the Great War. This exhibit examines the upheaval of world war as Americans confronted it, both at home and abroad. Located here in the Jefferson Building, it is compellingly, compellingly rendered and offers glimpses of the human condition transcendent from time and place, in part through over 30 collections from the Veterans History Project. I hope you'll find time to see it. I also ask that you consider taking a copy of the, of the library's magazine, which in, fo in part focuses on the Veterans History Project and our collections. Now a word about the Veterans History Project. It provides inspiration and instruction to foster a nationwide volunteer effort for individuals to reach out to the veterans in their lives and listen, really listen, and then donate those oral histories and personal narratives of their veterans from World War I through the current conflicts. Veterans like Mr. Greenwald, whose family graciously donated his interview to VHP and whose words came alive this morning through the portrayal by Douglas Terrell. If you are inspired by these veteran stories, consider the Veterans History Project for your veterans story. And thank you again for joining us today. get off that bus on recruitment day, you know you're not in Kansas anymore. Call the line! Let's go! Let's go! Get on the line, you maggot! Do you hear me? Look straight, you maggot! Every one of you will answer me with, aye, aye, sir! Am I understood? Aye, aye, sir! Get your hands up in the air! Aye, aye, sir! I said, get your hands down! Aye, aye, sir! I said, get your hands up in the air! Aye, aye, sir! I said, get your hands down! Aye, aye, sir! Turn to the right! Aye, aye, sir! Look at me now! Aye, aye, sir. You will move as fast and as tensely as you can. Am I understood? Aye, aye, sir. You will do what we say, when we say it, and how we say it. Am I understood? Aye, aye, sir.
I remember the stir in the country over the stamp tax and all the destruction of tea at Boston and elsewhere. I, I was only 13 or 14 years old then and just beginning to understand what was going on in the country. My grandfather, he talked very little to me about the French and Indian Wars. We lived on a small farm back in Boston, a little red house surrounded by birch maple trees. When I would ask him what it was like to fight in war, he would answer me with these steely blue eyes of his, almost as if the eyes themselves were speaking to me. He would say, son, war is hard. We march, we march, and we march some more. Don't ever forget that. But that's great, grandfather. That's what I want to do. I want to fight. I, I want to march. I want to experience the excitement in life. I want to be a patriot. My grandfather, he worked daily in the fields. He had developed a taste of agricultural pursuits from his days in battle. But he loved having his hands in the earth. I sometimes catch him working in the field, smiling almost as if he finally achieved something. He'd get up at, uh, at 4 a.m. and he wouldn't come in till sundown and then he'd just sit by the fire and he'd just stare. He seemed to prefer the silence. My mother told me he had led a great invasion into Canada and he had fought in many, many great battles. One day after dinner, I knelt down by him and I, I asked him, I said, Grandfather, please, Tell me what it's like to really fight in war, to experience battle. And he turned to me with those blue eyes of his, and he said, trees splintered. They become projectiles, jagged shards of wood going to men's faces and eyes. The forest, it, it screams. Officers and soldiers roar, horses shriek. Guns are blasting everywhere, and the ground is covered with the dead, and the air resounds with the groans of the dying. Well, I ignored my grandfather's advice, and I went ahead and enlisted and engaged myself for the preservations for the liberties of America. For I thought that now was the time for us Americans to free ourselves from the English and to set up a government of our own. On this cold morning, I find myself far away from home, away from my farm. And my grandfather was right. War is hard, very, very hard. We are here in Valley Forge in freezing temperatures, nearly starved. We have not eaten in four days and as many nights except a piece of birch bark, which I not off a stick of wood, <laughs> if that can be called food. I miss my farm, and I especially miss my grandfather. And I long for the days to be back in that farm in Boston, for I believe I, too, have developed a taste of agricultural pursuits. Dear Bill, I've come to this wall again to see and touch your name. And as I do, I wonder if anybody here realizes 
next to your name on this black wall is your mother's heart. A heart broken 15 years ago when you lost your life in Vietnam. As I look at your name, William R. Stocks. I think at times I must have wondered how scared and homesick you must have been in that strange country called Vietnam. And how I must have changed you. For you were always such a happy go lucky kid, never sad and never unhappy. And to the day I die, I'll always see you how you laughed at me, even when I was really angry. Before I knew it, we'd be laughing together. This past New Year's Day, I finally got my answer. I, I talked on the phone to a friend of yours from Michigan, Jim. Jim told me he had spent your last Christmas and the last four months of your life with you. Jim told me he was there when you died. He saw how the helicopter crashed. How you weren't scheduled to fly and how your pilot had been replaced by a less experienced pilot and the cause of the crash was unknown. How either you hit enemy or hit by enemy fire or you hit a pole or something. He also told me how you men were like sitting ducks. They would send you men out in the open to draw the enemy out, and then they sent in the planes and the big guns to take over. But in the meantime, death came to so many of you. He also told me instead of a yellow streak, a lot of the men got a mean streak. And each day that streak got bigger and meaner. Everyone except you, how you stay the same happy-go-lucky kid you were when you got to Vietnam. And how your warmth and friendliness to everyone to you. And how your lieutenant nicknamed you Spanky. And soon your entire group is nicknamed Spanky's Gang. He also told me how, how hard your death was for everyone. <coughs> how you, of all people, should not have been the one to have died. How you were there. How you were their moral support. I know when I got off the phone with Jim, he must have relived it all over again. I told him how much I loved him and I thanked him for being your friend. How lucky you were to have him as a friend and him to have had you. It, it hurts to write these letters and to leave them here at this wall. But I must face this pain and put it to rest. I'm okay, son. I'll see you next year. My second lesson was teamwork. We were doing exercises by the ripple, which means there's about 34 or 36 of us with our company commander in the middle. 
And they're called by the ripple because they go one after another, sort of like, um, like dominoes. And if anyone makes a mistake in the exact way how you're told how to do these exercises, you have to start all over at the beginning. And Adam Smith, a Southern Baptist Missouri kid, a really nice guy, but he wasn't a good soldier. He made a mistake. And we had to start all over at the beginning. So my company commander comes up and he starts yelling, is anybody here angry at Recruit Smith for making a mistake? So I speak up, yeah. yes sir, I am angry at Recruit Smith, sir. I feel we all should have to start at the beginning because of Recruit Smith, sir. Well, that was a life learning lesson. Because I, and only I, had to do all the exercises. I had to go to each recruit, state my name, do the exercises, and then ask them if I'd done it correctly. My name is Recruit Williams, and I will be doing my exercises for you. Did I do my exercises correctly? My name is Recruit Williams, and I will be doing my exercises for you. Did I do my exercises correctly? My name is Recruit Williams, and I will be doing my exercises for you. Did I do my exercises correctly? <sighs> Needless to say, it was humbling to say the least. So my company commander comes up and starts yelling, are you still angry at Recruit Smith for making a mistake? <sighs> and at that minute, minute, a light bulb went off. I just realized what this was. This was a game. Life is a game. And you have to play the game with rules. We're all in this together. And no man is above another man. And the way you survive is by helping your fellow man and working together as a team. It's the way you survive war. And it's the way you survive life. Tired of being scared. I just want to come home, and no matter how hard I try, I can't seem to come home. When you go off to war, you just don't come back the same person you were as you left. And you just don't sit at the dinner table and say, I'm home now. It just doesn't work that way. The adjustment is tough. It's, it's real tough. I have an incredible temper now, one I never had before. I'm abusive to my wife. <laughs> I can't, can't hold a job. Nothing matters to me anymore. And the worst part of being back home I don't want to touch my son. I'm terrified of infecting him with the evils that I've seen him done. To grab my boy with these same bloody hands, I feel as if I would destroy his purity. I will infect him.
when you go off to war, you go off as a kid. But when you come back, you're all, you're all dirty inside. You're all hollow. I was on the first landing phase at Iwo Jima. I, uh, I saw hundreds of dead men. Faces gone, bodies exposed. That's what Iwo Jima was. It was a, it was a killing field. I mean, when we landed, I mean, we took a hell of a shellacking. I mean, they met us with everything. I remember just running on the beach and covering my head and, and, and crying like a baby. My, my knees were shaking. My body was trembling like it was, like it was, like it was jelly. When we was on the beach, my captain comes up and he yells, I need three guys to go with me to see what the Japs are up to. <laughs> I thought anything was better than being stuck here. So me, Vincent, and Lucky, we volunteered. We walked over the, over the rocks into the dark jungle. It, it was silent. It was as if you walked through the front door of someone's home who didn't want you to be there. After several hours, I realized we was lost. Hey, man, where the fuck are we? <laughs> and at that moment, my captain was shot. And I spot the Jap who shot him, so I bring up my rifle. And I bring him down. And Lucky yells, make sure he's dead! <laughs> Do it! So I run up to him and I see him still moving, so I, so I bring out my knife and I I just slit a man's throat. No matter what the army trained me to do, they could have never trained me what it's like to kill another human being, and I, and I just did, and I felt terrible because of it. I just walked away, and I looked at my hands, and they was, they was covered in blood. It was as if someone spilled a red gallon of red paint all over them. When you go off to war, you don't kill someone in a kind way. You do it with cruelty. You're scared. You kill, and if you don't kill, you get killed. War is nasty. It's terrible. Very few things you did or endured in combat ever leave you. The darkness of the events, they're as vivid in my mind as I was. It's when I was in combat. Physical wounds generally heal in time. But the memories of battle, they... They cut too deep, they... They burn the soul, they never go away. No, never. I was a nice kid before I left. And now I'm not. I'm, I'm broken. <laughs> I've become good friends with Jim and Jack. You may know it's Jim Bean and Jack Daniels. They helps me forget. <laughs> You are working too hard, man. What are you doing? <laughs> Search and destroy. 
digging holes. Greeny, it don't matter what you do, man. The Viet Cong could be right in front of you, and you still wouldn't know it. They're so embedded in these hills. Doesn't matter how many holes you dig, or artillery shells, or bombs we drop on them, we ain't never gonna get them out. So stop digging that hole, man, and come over here and smoke some shit. <laughs> you gotta take it easy in there, man, or else you ain't gonna make it. Ain't no cows in this place. Just alive or dead. Here, smoke some. You don't smoke? <laughs> You will <laughs> give yourself a weekend. You'll be smoking. You gotta smoke to escape the beast, escape hell, escape reality. Doesn't matter how much training you've done, Greedy. Vietnam is a whole new fucked up world, man. This place is a steam bath, 24/7, infested with bugs and insects and snakes. And I hate snakes, man. They got the most poisonous snake in the world here, the two-step. And you know why it's called the two-step? Because if that son of a bitch bites you, you get two steps before you die. <laughs> oh, shit. Green, there's a two-step right next to you. No, I ain't messing around. He's right there. I'm just going to reach over here and get my knife. Don't move, man. <laughs> I'm just messing around. <laughs> Just messing with you, baby. <laughs> Take it easy, man. Here, man, smoke some. Ah, oh, damn, Greeny. Now, where are you from? Iowa? Whew, man, you are far from home. This place ain't nothing like Iowa, man. Tell me something, man. What's everyone saying about us back home? Because I keep reading my dad's letters that he's starting to have doubts about us in this war. He says we shouldn't be over here. Just people back home are marching and protesting against us, calling us baby killers. I ain't a baby killer, man. These sons of bitches up in these hills ain't no babies. And if they are, there's some badass motherfucking babies firing eight millimeter machine guns at us. Yeah. If everyone from back home were with us when we were stranded and surrounded by a full battalion of NVA, they talk different about us in this war. Pinned down, taking fire from every direction, tracer rounds flying through the air. Buddies being blown away. See, that's the shit about war, Greeny, that no one prepares you for. It's the sounds of war. Bullets cracking, bombs landing, artillery shells exploding, men screaming and yelling for their mamas. It's just a big ball of deafening noise, man. And when you hear that shit, that's when you know the beast is hungry, man. And that's why you gotta smoke, man, to escape the beast. Every time I get high, man, I get closer to home. I can see myself walking through the back door and hear my mama go, dinner's almost ready, baby. Sit on that back porch and watch those Texas sunsets. She'll be quiet. When I get out of here, I don't want to hear another thing about Vietnam or war. What's that? You want to hit? Yeah. I thought you'd come around. <laughs> I miss the edge, baby. Yeah! Get some! Woo! I miss that! I miss the feeling of a 50 caliber machine gun, the feeling of the power coursing through your veins with a pull of a trigger, the sounds of locking and loading your guns. Yeah! Woo! -hoo! Woo! Woo! -hoo! Get some! Man, I miss that!
Now what I miss the most, I miss my buddies, my brothers. But it's crazy because I know once I go back, I'll be all depressed. I wish I could feel more comfortable being back home. My wife, she doesn't, she doesn't want me to go back. And I don't blame her, but I've only done one deployment. Some of my buddies have done two, three, four, five deployments. They've been back to back to back to back. I mean, some of the crap they've experienced is freaking overwhelming. Since I've been back home, I've been reminded how much I miss my wife. I do. I love her. I mean, when you're over there, you miss the feel of a woman. You miss the, you miss the smell of a woman. But I'm having such a hard time finding things to talk to her about. I mean, it's not her fault. It's just a lot of stuff she says to me is so meaningless and senseless. Honey, should we go to Kim's house for dinner or should we go to the movies? What I think we really need to do is uh, paint the kitchen and get some brand new drapes. What we really need is a brand new crock pot. What do I care about a crock pot? I mean, I don't tell them, but that's what I'm thinking. I mean, how can I talk about this mundane crap when I've been over there blowing crap away like a freaking video game? Everyone back here, they don't have the same appreciation for being alive as you do because it ain't life and death. Everyone here has all that other stress that you can't seem to relate to because it ain't life and death. I mean, as a sense of purpose, man, combat is sin. It's the only game in town. All the things that make life worth living back home, they're not present when we're in combat. I mean, we talk about firefights. We dream about firefights. I don't think I could ever be satisfied with a normal life, whatever that is. I think I'm ruined for anything else. War? War is a lot of things, but let me tell you, it is useless to pretend that exciting isn't one of them. It is fucking insanely exciting. The sounds it makes, the machinery of it, the urgency of its use, the consequences of almost everything about it is the most exciting things anyone engaged in war has ever experienced. I mean, we talk about this stuff with our friends and our families, but they'll never know. No, they'll never know. War is bad. But let me tell you, holding a 50 caliber machine gun is amazing. War is life multiplied by some number you've never even heard of. 20 minutes of combat is more life than you can scrape together in a lifetime of doing something else. I know it's sad, but being back home, it's boring. There's an aliveness when you're in combat. Everything is living. It's like this intense quiet. All you hear is your footsteps. I'd be firing my saw. Woohoo, man! This is it, baby! This is combat! Everything is living. I mean, you're never more alive until you're almost dead. War is hell. But it's also mysterious and beautiful for all its horror. War makes you a man, but it's crazy. Because I know once I go back, I'll be all depressed. And then I come back here, and all I can think about is war. It's like, I have a, it's like I have a mistress. I've got my wife, which is love, and this hot, Sexy, dangerous mistress, which is war, baby! Woohoo! Woo -hoo -hoo! Yeah! Yeah! Woo! -hoo! Woo! Just know. Can I promise? Of course I can promise. Your daddy loves you very much. I miss him a lot. And my son really misses him. And we have to give up so much for him to go back.
This is going to be his third tour in Afghanistan. When dinner rolls around and I start thinking about what I have to make for dinner, I forget that Mike is leaving us today and that afterwards we're going to have to sit at the dinner table alone. And the first night is always the hardest. You have this little one who's mirroring all your emotions and you're trying to act like everything is okay even though you don't feel like it's okay. He misses a lot of events in our life, events that we can't get back, so we think of creative ways to keep them with us. And one of the ways was Mike on a stick. He's taking this picture we put on a popsicle stick. I know, it's weird. It's definitely weird when we go to restaurants and we ask Mike if my son can have chicken tenders. <laughs> the waiter always looks at us like we belong in a, in a psych ward or something. But it helps. It really helps. I miss him a lot. But my son, My son really has a hard time. I, I, I miss my daddy so much. He misses all my, my events in my life, like, like when I became a Weeblo. A lot of my friends who don't know about the military, just from what they see in, in movies and stuff like that, they think it's kind of cool that my dad wears a uniform and fires guns and stuff like that, but it, it, it's, it's really hard to say bye to your daddy. I, I miss him so much. Hey. Don't tell anybody, okay? Because I don't know if this is legal. But I'm... I'm trying to invent a machine that I can hook my daddy up to so that he, so that he never goes away again. My son, Jeff, he was a real, uh, a real fun-loving boy, a real social boy, a um, <laughs> clown, a real rascal. Jeff, can you please stop jumping off the couch? Yes, I know you can fly like Superman, but I don't want you to do it in the living room. He really enjoyed life. I'm often asked if I had the opportunity to trade the mental wounds that he suffered in Iraq for the bullet that he didn't receive, would I trade it? I don't know. I just hated to see him suffer the way he did. I remember when he came back, I really thought that was a new chapter, that was a new beginning for him. But soon after he, he came back, I realized that he was far from unscathed, that the wounds he didn't understand were starting to terrify him and the rest of us. His, his body had returned, but that wasn't our boy anymore. He had become someone we'd never even seen before. It was on the first anniversary of the Iraq war, he and his girlfriend were supposed to go to Vermont to celebrate. And for some reason, they had a tremendous fight, and he became really depressed. And he came back home and he stayed with us. 
and he would sit in the living room staring at the fire in the fireplace. I'd go up to him and I'd say, son, let's go, let's go to the VA and get some help. And he'd always reply with, I can't go, Dad. I'm sorry, I just can't go. Nothing matters to me anymore. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He was so terrified of the stigma, he didn't want his unit to see him as weak. That night, he came to me and he asked me if, if he could sit in my lap and if we could rock together like we did when he was a little boy. I felt lost and I felt confused, but I said, of course you can, son. Of course you can. So here, I have this Marine <laughs> sitting in my lap. And I told him how much I loved him and how much I, how, how proud I, I was of him. And I began to rock him. And it felt natural holding my little boy again. I thought he was coming back to us that night. We both went to bed and I slept peacefully for the first time in a long time. You know, when your little ones grow up, they never really grow up. I mean, you worry about them the same way you did when they were first born. The next morning, I went to his room to knock on the door, and the door was locked. Hey, Jeff, open up, son. Jeff, open the door. That would be the last time I would hold my son. Would I ask that we would have a, a quicker death? I would have just asked that he would have had a good life. I remember at the funeral cursing God. Why did you give him to us if you were going to let him suffer so much? I wish I would have put my arms around him and said, son, let's go get some help, not only for you, but for the both of us. So now what's happened is we become his, his voice. And we don't do it in anger. And what's happened is a lot of families have come up to us and said, we don't want to be like you. We don't want to be grieving parents. So we tell them about the mistakes we've made and we tell them how hard it's, how hard it's going to be. And there's going to be days when you feel you can't do anything right. But, but don't give up. Don't ever, ever, ever give up. And don't think for a second they won't do it. My gravest sin as a father was thinking that Jeff wouldn't commit suicide. Not my boy.
shit, this is hard. <laughs> There's a lot of things you take for granted in life, you know? You don't know how valuable something is until you lose it. When I lost my arm, I really wanted to die. I didn't know what my, what my wife would think of me, what my son would think of me. I felt like I let my, my family down, you know? I couldn't be the man I used to be. I sometimes I'd be looking at my son, wondering if he's thinking, I don't like the way my dad looks now. That is the hardest thing about losing a limb, is how you see yourself in the mirror. You have this image that you're trying to see. But when you look in there, he's not there anymore, he's, he's, he's gone. One of the things that I found really hard was when I came back, I really thought it was going to be like, a, you know, a nice sunny day and the Marine Corps band was going to be playing. It was going to be confetti and silly string. But when I came back, there was nothing, nothing at all. And I didn't think it would affect me, but it did, you know, it bothered me a lot. I used to be a pitcher in college and I was good. It didn't matter if it was a strikeout or a home run, I could focus on the next pitch. You know, and that mental focus, it served me well on the battlefield. I mean, I found dozens of IEDs and I saved my brothers. But when I came back, I couldn't focus on anything. No. I keep getting these these pains in my left side. And I keep imagining that my arm is still there, but only like three inches long, which is freaking weird, no? Because not only did I lose my arm, I keep imagining I've got an arm of an elf or something. Everybody in rehab keeps telling me, this is normal, these are called phantom limb pains. Well, it may be normal for you, but it's pretty freaking weird to me, man. Yeah, when I came back, I wallowed around for, for weeks and, and months. But then my wife, she spoke some truth to me. She said, mira pendejo, I love you with one arm or no arm, but if you don't get off your ass and start fighting for your life, I'm leaving your one arm ass. And you know what? She was right. She gave me the kick in the balls that I needed. I stopped feeling sorry for myself. Start to understand how I can fight and dominate in this world that I now lived in. You see, a lot of times we think that our limitations are on the outside. They don't know. They're in the inside. Life opens up when you focus on the possibilities inside of you. And you stop making excuses. Hey, Charlie, you got a light? I'm not the third one in the match, am I? Good, because I don't need any more bad luck. I got enough. Don't be scared, Charlie. 
It's just a short walk over the top. Once we hear that whistle, we climb out of these trenches and we tumble over as rapidly as we can. And we run through the 30 yards of barbed wire entanglement and we zigzag towards our enemy. <laughs> it's a beautiful sight, Charlie. When those German shells hit the ground, they shed a fantastic light upon this earth. Just imagine a vast semicircle of light sailing up every minute and burning for 20 or 30 seconds and then fizzing me out like a rocket, lighting up every man, tree, and bush within a half mile. The flashes in the sky and the heavy claps of thunder from the unseen guns create an amazing spectacle. like the 4th of July, Charlie. Soon we'll be at home eating cherry pie. Hey, Charlie, what's your favorite part of a girl? Legs? Ah, Charlie. Every girl's got legs. Me? Breast. I love a woman's breast, Charlie. My Mary has these big beauties. Every time I smell her scent on those letters she writes me, I imagine my head right in the middle of them. I kiss my wedding ring for good luck, Charlie, that it brings me back home and back to my beautiful Mary. Stand up, Charlie. Let's go fight the Hun. I'll be there by your side, Charlie. I, I promise. It's a short walk, Charlie. This is our great adventure. Hey, Charlie. I want you to know something. I'm the luckiest fellow in the world, for I know what the true meaning of what love is. Hey. You're my chum, Charlie. And I'll be with you every step of the way. We fight for each other, Charlie. Dear sir, the indications are strong that we shall be moving in a few days, perhaps tomorrow. Lest I should not be able to write you again, I feel compelled to write a few lines that may fall under your eyes when I shall be no more. If it is necessary that I should fall on the battlefield for my country, I am ready. I have no misgivings or lack of confidence for the cause in which I am engaged, and my courage does not halt or falter, for I know how strong the American civilization now leans upon the triumph 
of our government and the great debt we owe those who went before us through the blood and suffering of the American Revolution. And I am willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all my joys in this life to help maintain this government and to pay that debt. Cheryl, my love for you is absolutely deathless, and it seems to bind me with mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence could break. But my love for my country comes over me like a strong wind and bears me irresistibly on onto the battlefield. I cannot describe to you the feelings on this calm summer night with 2,000 men sleeping around me, perhaps enjoying their last before that of death. And I, suspicious that death is creeping behind me with that fatal dot, am communing with God, country, and thee. The memories of the blissful moments I have spent with you come crawling over me, and I am grateful to God and you that I have enjoyed them for so long. And it is hard for me to give them up and to burn to ashes the hopes in the future years when, God willing, we might have lived and loved to see our sons grow up to be honorable men. I have few but small claims upon divine providence. But something whispers to me Perhaps it's the wafting prayers of my little Edgar that I shall return to my loved ones unharmed. But if I do not, Sarah, never forget how much I love you. And when my last breath escapes me on the battlefield, it shall whisper your name. There'll be a soft breeze pressed upon your cheek. That shall be my spirit passing by and kissing you. Do not mourn me, sir. Wait for me, for we shall meet again. final lesson was brotherhood. When we were at the memorial service for Adam, Adam was struck by an IED and he was killed in Afghanistan. We had this guy in our battalion that can play the bagpipes and our star major found out, so unfortunately for him, he had to play the bagpipes at every memorial we had in Afghanistan. But it was a blessing for us because he was really good at it. 
And there's something extraordinary, moving, and beautiful about the sound of a bagpipe. And if you're not Irish or Scottish, for those brief moments, you, you kind of wish you were. Adam had attended uh, ranger school, and he had been there for seven or eight months, and he was battling to finish, but he got dropped. And if anyone knows anything about the ranger tab, it's a pretty coveted tab to have. If you get it, well, you can razz anybody who doesn't have it. And if you don't get it, well, you get razzed. At the memorial service for Adam, everyone who was ranger qualified, as they walked by his picture to say their final goodbyes and make their final salutes, they all took off their ranger tab and placed it on the memorial for Adam. Sort of as a, as a recognition that he was more than just another guy who got killed. And at that moment, you realize that it's not about you anymore. It's about your country. But more importantly, it's about the men we serve with. When I hear taps now, I can feel it. It means something to me. I realize, I realize now that I'm part of an amazing history. I'm part of a brotherhood. Question, how did you come up with this amazing story? <laughs> now I get a mic. I didn't need one for the show, but I get one. <laughs> you for it. I, um, uh, what a day, huh? Uh, so I, I, long story short is I have incredible empathy for the veterans. So I, I started creating letters about eight years ago when a lot of our men and women were coming back with severe PTSD, and a lot of stories were in the newspaper, especially about guys who couldn't work and pay their bills. That really seemed to pull on my, my strings. So I wanted, as an artist, I wanted to do something to give back. I wanted people to really understand what commitment really meant. So I started creating these letters, and, and I started workshopping it, you know, in front of friends, and. And the show has changed a lot from when I started like seven years ago, but people kept saying, you've got to keep going. I think you're on to something. So long story short, I, 
I found a director, Patrick, I don't know if he's here, and there he is, and I said, you know, I got a bunch of letters from soldiers, you wanna work on, you wanna work on this with me? So I did a monologue for him, and he kind of liked it, and he says, I think we're on to something, and so we put it together, and we kind of created the show, and I kind of, I, um, I finally found the final structure that I wanted, and we performed it, and I've been doing it for two years now, and I've been all over the country with it. Uh, last year, I was at the Kennedy Center. Um, September, I was in Connecticut, Virginia, Kansas. I've been in Texas. I've been in all over New York. Um, it's going to West Point, it's going to the Citadel. Um, and it just, people keep asking me to do it. And I love to do it, and I love to share the stories, so that's kind of, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of how it became what it is today. I hear something. Oh, is there a question up there or no? no? Okay, oh. all right, well. Thank you, and a reminder that this is based on, on letters and stories, um, and I know that you know, Karen mentioned the importance of preserving those, so, uh, oops, sorry, question. Can you, can you share a little bit about your history as an actor, as an artist? Sure, um, well, I'm a professional actor. I've been doing it for many moons now. Um, you, you probably recognize me in TV. I do a lot of, I play a lot of cop, and a lot of hitman type roles on TV. Um, theater is my passion, I love it. Um, I've been doing it in New York for 20 years now, and, um, um, but yeah, I mean, I have a movie coming out with, uh, uh, Mackie Gyllenhaal, the kindergarten teacher. I play a cop in there with her. Um, so the sense, so serious sensibilities tend to draw me. <laughs> so I'm funny when I'm drinking, but I never get cast as a comedy guy. <laughs> and so, uh, but, um, but yeah, I mean, not to spit off my resume, but that's who I am as an actor. I, but I love the stage, it's for my training. I've been really blessed to work with some amazing theater people. I've worked with, um, I've studied with Wynn Hanman. He was kind of the, the, um, the nucleus of my acting as an actor here in New York. He's legendary, he's, he's, he's worked with everybody from Dustin Hoffman to, to Al Pacino, I mean, the who's a who's of actors. And, uh, and his classes were really great because we always worked on character and you had to do a monologue and you had to create this guy or this girl or well, whatever and, and you had to find the, the, the dialect and the behavior and the, what, everything about him. So his training really led me into this type of work because in many ways this is what I'm doing. I'm finding out who the guy is, how does he talk, how does he walk, what, what are his, his, uh, his, his speech patterns and so it's character work. So that's really where my training, and he's Meisner based. I don't know if anybody knows anything about acting, but he's very Meisner based. But um, yeah, that, he's pretty much who I owe my acting to. Yeah. Yes, Austin, that's my son. He asked me another question. What'd you say, son? Oh, Jesus Christ, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah, a lot of shows, son. <laughs> I've been in True West all of my... Uh, one more question and then I think we'll have to wrap up. Mice and men first. Um, I was going to, sorry, I was going to ask, have there have been any like initiatives or anything to get veterans into theater, maybe as a way for like therapy for PTSD? Have you thought yeah. of any projects like that? Yeah, there's tons. I mean, the, it, theater has become a really powerful, there's two new forms of therapy that are starting to pop up for veterans. Um, uh, equestrian, equestrian therapy it's with horses. Um, some really good stuff with that and theater. So they're getting, there's, there's, a, there's a, a project called The Telling Project and I've been back and forth with them. But what they do is they actually, so they do what I do, but they have the veterans tell their own stories. They act out their own stories. And it's been really powerful for them because it's allowed them to basically, the, the thing with my show and what veterans need, which is really hard, and I'm creating a web series for Thomas Edison Military Academy based on it, but they need to talk. And what happens is when you go into the military, you're kind of revved up to be a warrior and to destroy all your vulnerabilities because your vulnerabilities don't help you as a soldier in battle. But when you come back, you need those vulnerabilities as a human being to say, you know, I'm hurting right now. 
So, but they're so conditioned to not be vulnerable that they don't know how to express themselves anymore. And that's where the problem comes because they carry all this stuff inside and they start, you know, and they struggle with it. And um, some more than others, but the ones who can talk about it tend to seem to really help themselves. But therapy, I mean, uh, theater and um, horse therapy has been some two new versions have been popping up. But the military is even looking into theater. Um, and, and I did the show in, in Kansas for about 300 um, Vietnam veterans. And afterwards, we, we had some great stories, but they all said, um, they all told me the same thing. It was like, it's so cathartic to hear your stories because it allows me to talk about them. And, to, and that's the first time I've been able to really express them. So, um, but yeah, I mean, just for everybody to know, I mean, only 1% of our population serve. And so we, we put a tremendous amount of de demand on those guys and men and women. So it's just good for us to remember that 1% of our population is our fighting force. So. Doug, I want to thank you again. Awesome. And I just uh, learned a little quick commercial that Doug's going to be back uh, for Memorial Day. So I would ask between now and then you think about who the veteran in your life or your community is. And as Doug said, they, they're out there. They need to talk. They don't always realize they need to talk. And don't ask them the hard question. Just ask them, wow, what was it like? Um, let them come up with the, with, yeah. the, with the downside. But, but ask them those questions about what was the food like? What was the best part? Or perhaps, you know, what were your instructors like uh, to get them talking? And I will tell you, as a veteran, I didn't think I had a story. Um, and I had a good interviewer. And we, at the Veterans History Project, we teach how to interview. In fact, there's a class going on right now. Um, and so think about reaching out to the Veterans History Project uh, to help us uh, teach you how to interview so that you can uh, interview that veteran in your life. So again, Doug, thank you so much for coming. I would like to thank everybody in the audience for coming as well, for making this just a really Please share it on Twitter and Facebook. Yes. If you're on there, tag me, and I have a website called the American Soldier Solo Show com. But use the American Soldier as a tag. The more people get out, the more I can keep doing the show. Great. So don't be lazy. Get on social media. All right. Thank you again. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.